At first, Turing came close to being a lark, off to play in great halls with great orchestras and conductors, and to great reviews. He had an instant appeal, beyond words. So he crossed Europe to Cheers. And everywhere he went, to Israel, Germany, Britain, he won applause, securing fame and reputation. He spent months away. There were many miles to travel. It was exhausting. There were illnesses. What was Glenn giving of himself that so touched the imagination and the heart? He was a great humanitarian, and he tried to hide it. Generally, people didn't understand that part of Ben, the great depth of uh, soul and heart that he felt. And, uh, it all comes through. Gould was news, different with his chair, his unpretentious ways. His music was discussable, and he was unpredictable. This friendly, memorable Canadian. Nothing mattered except the kind of music making you were hearing, and that is what I always heard from Glenn Gould, without exception. By now, his name was linked the world over with Sebastian Bach, the greatest of all architects of sound. On tour, on records, and in Canada on television, it was Bach, again and again. Of all Glenn's tours, the visit in 1957 to the Soviet Union was especially memorable for him. And it's still remembered there. He was the first North American artist to visit with his manager, Walter Homburger. Homburger showered with flowers. I mean, and not only flower, cut flowers, but uh, huge plants. And uh, when we finally got back into the limousine, the whole car was full of these plants. And I said to Glenn, I think we're driving to our own funeral at this point. The plants were actually planted in the garden of the embassy in the end. But Glenn got a tremendous thrill out of that. I'm a very bad tourist, you know. I tend to get like a horse with blinders on when I am in places where I'm supposed to admire because of their scenic beauty. In fact, I, I really did a bit of sightseeing there because that was like, so much like being on the other side of the moon that not to take advantage of it would have been a catastrophe. He gave lectures too, in Russian, in English, on contemporary music. His tours were a success wherever he went. Come back, they said, please come back. Glenn's appeal was universal. He touched people's minds and stirred their feelings. There was a kind of intensity about his playing. It's a particular kind of musical intellect. It is a particular kind of awareness of the shape and meaning of the music, both structurally and emotionally, and the purpose of every note's being there. I don't think the intellect ever overrode his sense of the emotional message. But he didn't like concertizing, the aggressive competition again, and playing for mob reactions, the herd response. It seems to me that um, an audience is there for only one purpose, and that is to listen. They are not there to respond. They are not there to applaud. You have to consider them individually, not for their mass response. It is just as if you were playing for a few friends who unfortunately got too many, you know? Recordings and the intimacy of television were his ideal for making music, for you, the listener, with friends like Yehudi Menuhin. And they were particular friends. Glenn Gould rarely practiced. A waste of time, he thought. He didn't have to. He said, if I practice, I lose my spontaneity. If he shook hands with someone, it really did affect his fingers. He really did have to practice. And um, he did soak his hands in hot uh, water, and he did wear gloves. But it was all a shortcut to being able to sit down and play the piano instantly without any warming up whatsoever. Once, John Roberts saw him sight-read the Greek concerto. 
well, with his eyes glued to the score, never looking once at his hands, um, he commenced, and it was just astounding. Sounded like Horowitz. Um, very brilliant and a tremendous speed, incredible speed. I thought he'll never be able to keep this up. But when he came to the cadenza of the first uh, movement, which is extremely difficult, um, there are arpeggiated sections where you already have to think very carefully what you're doing. Otherwise, it's, it's really quite hard not to play wrong notes. And um, I thought, he's just got to come unstuck. Just got to. Not a bit of it. Um, it was astounding. He came to the last movement. He took it at a most incredible speed. Again, I thought, how can he keep this up? Um, he sailed through the, uh, the, uh, the work, gave absolutely the most remarkable performance of it. He played all the orchestral parts whenever he could, sang those which he couldn't quite make, and at the end, shut the score and said, it's not for me. I asked him at the end of the Greek, Glenn, don't you find anything difficult? And he said, well, not really. I try mainly not to look at the battlefield, meaning the keyboard. I think it worried him that he really didn't know how he produced such results. I mean, from a technical point of view. He said to me, for instance, I could never teach. He didn't ever want to think analytically about pianistic things. As long as he didn't know it was difficult, it wasn't difficult. He loathed pianistic talk. That is how one actually did things with fingers and hands. All he knew was that he could do it. His music was European, but Glenn was North American, and his imagination was Canadian. Robert Fulford. There was an element of his work that was distinctly Canadian, I think, and that was the freedom, the openness, the sense of possibility that was natural to him. It wasn't something he had to fight for. He didn't have to fight back layers of prejudice in himself. He didn't have to keep pushing through dead ideas. to live a creative life his way. His manager, Walter Homberger, understood. Most others thought maybe he'll have a hiatus of uh, several years and then decide uh, he misses it too much. And I said, don't count on it. Once Glenn has made up his mind, he usually, having known him, sticks to it. Applause, the world's glories, didn't mean much to him, pilgrim that he was. He won many honors. They were appreciated, but somehow... Bruno Mont-Saint-Jean produced several TV programs with Glenn Gould. He did not want any kind of applause. He did not want reactions, uh, but he did want communication. He did want uh, give and take. Uh, he did want people to react without that kind of noisy reaction, but to, to share what he was doing. I've never seen him more happy than in the studio, in the company of people, provided they shared, you know, the enthusiasm in his way towards creation. I've had m more interesting comments on Glenn Gould from non-musicians than from musicians, because 
I think that Glenn was definitely a threat to the musical profession. You know, everything that was established, that was routine, that was taken for granted in music, um, that is taken for granted in, in the world of music, has been uh, shattered by, by Glenn's thought. So that, you know, as a man, uh, as a living man, he was a threat to the musical profession. He was a threat to the competitive aspect of music making. He was the a threat to, to the, the power grabbing that a lot of, of, of interpreters are about. Uh, as soon as it was evident that uh, he could be the greatest pianist in the world at the drop of a hat, uh, he was no longer interested in doing that. He wanted to move on to uh, other things. He wanted to find new talents within him. Now, the only problem about that was that these talents hadn't been developed since he was three years old. He had to find them, and it was a tremendous struggle, tremendous struggle, to um, pry them out and to develop them. If you look at his early writings and compare them with his later writings, you'll see how he uh, developed. He was, of course, very clever in his first articles, but the, uh, the later ones have a breadth of view which the earlier ones uh, didn't have, and also a facility with language which is more sophisticated than the, uh, the early ones. He was a great concert pianist, and he decided not to be a concert pianist at all. And I think that was the most individualistic, the most radical thing he did in his life. And it led to the triumphs of his later years as a recording artist and as a thinker, because it freed him. It made him his own man in a way that he couldn't have been otherwise. I think it was a tremendously courageous decision. Gould was a person who did not, as someone might think, really have a, a smooth ride all the way. It was not all one triumph to another triumph to another triumph. His life had its miseries and its obstacles, just like anybody else's. But he consistently and obstinately pursued a vision which presented itself to him, certainly by the time he was in his late teens, and said, I can lead a life of a certain kind. I can make use of my capabilities in a certain way. But the decision as to what ultimately this kind will be and these ways will be, was, will have to be my decision because no other decision is going to be worth anything. Perhaps he'd always known that he'd have to take the risk. His journey would be north. He loved the idea of the north. And I think that that was a very Canadian aspect of him, too. I think all of us who grew up in Canada, we all grew up with an idea of the north in our head, that there is a, a vast abstraction up there. You can drive for 1,200 miles, and then you can keep going for a long, long time, and you're still in Canada. I think that that's part of the Canadian imagination. I can't think of the withdrawal of any other major artist of this importance in our generation, our time, uh, that left me with a greater sense of loss in that. There was never a time when I didn't want to hear Glenn Gould come back and play again. A new beginning. Like Bach, like Schoenberg, Glenn Gould was a conservative and a radical, standing as far as he could from the mainstream and fashion, peering ahead eager to do what hadn't been done before. He had years of creative work in mind. He dared to be himself. He read the future. He saw that technology was changing the world. He felt that uh, music had to change with it. By that, I mean music had to adapt itself to the technology. A way had to be found. But we'll see what the future says. We have to wait and see. He was in advance of his time. We'll see what is said in the year 2000 or 2010. By that time, we may have caught up with him. This is London calling in the North American service of the BBC. It is the news read by 
Okay, chickadees, here's the one you've been asking for. And tonight it's specially dedicated to Paul from Doris, to Marianne from a secret admirer, and to all the men in special detention detail out at the Institute, from Big Bertha and the gals of the MS Vagabond, riding at anchor just a cozy quarter mile beyond the international limit, Pet Clark with that question we've all been asking. I walk alone and wonder, who am I? The buildings reach up to the sky. The traffic thunders on the busy street. The pavement slips beneath my feet. I walk alone and wonder, who am I? He was a great concert pianist. I think there were people who were quite willing to say he was the greatest concert pianist in the world, and he decided not to be a concert pianist at all. And I think that was the most individualistic, the most radical thing he did in his life. And it led to the triumphs of his later years as a recording artist and as a thinker, because it freed him. It made him uh, his own man in a way that he couldn't have been otherwise. He was now on his own. He would go off and create his own thinking and his own music. Once Glenn dropped the onerous burden of concert giving, he redesigned his style of life, and eventually there by himself. Close personal relationships were promptly put out on the doorstep. He lived alone. An avid reader and morning calls regarding the stock market kept him well informed. Also, with sometimes two radios and a television set going at the same time, he kept in touch with many public personalities, through this electronic wallpaper, as he chose to call it. Such was his acquaintanceship with singer Petula Clark. They never met nor spoke. Glenn discovered her when driving alone on a northern trip, when her voice drifted into his car radio from one repeater station to the next. He felt that she represented something quite significant for the flower child generation, and wrote a haunting radio essay called the search for Petula Clark. I walk alone and wonder who am I? The documentary was not only about Petula, but also about Glenn, alone along the north shore of Lake Superior. Discover who am I? I long to wake up in the morning and find... We can't really call it non-conformity, because it's not that. The non-conformist has a complete and utter disregard for the opinions of others and for the admiration and affection of the public. Gould had a lot of that. He needed the admiration and affection of the public. So he was not some kind of nonconformist. But he was a person who said that the main line of creative endeavor is done in solitude. He believed that his creative productivity increased when he was alone, and he would literally seal himself off in places where he could just be alone. Isn't really as far north as it appears to be. It's about 550 miles from Toronto in a place called Wawa, which is on the northeast shore of Lake Superior. It's an extraordinary place. I've been coming up here for about four or five years now to sort out some thoughts and try to get some writing done. And um, Something very strange happened to me the first time I was up here. I was away for about two weeks, away from Toronto and away from cities and away from city living and city thinking. And um, I did, I think, the best writing of my entire life at that time. And um, I decided it was the sort of therapy I needed. And I've been coming back for more of the same ever since. And um, it hasn't let me down yet. It's an extraordinary spot. One of the first things that I did was a program called The Idea of North, which was a program that meant a great deal to me because in addition to the fact that it allowed a certain amount of experimentation with radio in a direction that's not been tried before as far as I know, it was about the North, and the North does mean something very special to me. I've not really been North because I don't fly anything. The Idea of North was the first of three innovative radio documentaries that consumed Glenn over the next years. They were all concerned with isolation, and self-realization. They were also concerned with the music of the human voice. You know, it's always seemed to me that when... I think we have to regard the Gouldian contrapuntal radio documentary as a kind of art form of which he was the inventor. And for all purposes, um, the sole uh, practitioner. He did regard his documentaries, as we'll call them, as works of art. He publicly said many times, early and late, they are music, and the making of them is composing music. 
But there was a thing about Glenn Gould. We all, we're all to blame for this. We always thought he should get back to the concert hall. And who is this piano player? Uh, who does he think he is uh, claiming to be composing? So uh, we do tend to want people to be in slots. And Gould, of course, uh, never fitted a slot. So we uh, did not receive these documentaries as works of art, not merely in the sense of having no precedent, being highly innovative, but in the sense of being fantastically complex, simply trying to behold them with something that you had to devote all your attention to. And having devoted your attention, you know perfectly well that you're going to have to do it another time and another and another. But he would say, why not? You have to do the same for the last act, uh, f finale of uh, uh, Otello is one example he uses, or any of the late Beethoven string quartet. Why not? And he's right, why not? I suppose that I would like, as a writer, to bring musical ideas to bear on the techniques of writing. I've always been fascinated with the metrical things that one can do with the human voice, both writing for it and editing it, editing it in terms of the documentaries that I prepare. Not entirely to his own satisfaction. Once home in Leipzig, I would have said about saving. That's why I guess I end up uh, in a recording room doing about the most futile thing anyone can do conducting the spoken human voice already in the can. One can't change its cadence, but one can change one's own reaction to its cadence and gain ideas from its cadence and prepare the next cadence of the next human voice. And that's why I find radio documentary especially so very fascinating because one can make. Well, it sounds pompous, and I don't mean it to, but one can make a statement about the human condition by virtue of the way in which you can define it through using the human voice. Glenn was of the world, but not in the world. A very private person with an extraordinary inner life. His real world was that of the mind, and through solitude, he saw his abilities to communicate with the outside world develop enormously. There are some extraordinary insights available to people who have put their life in a deep freeze and set it aside and said we will now look at it and see it against what it could have been had we lived elsewhere. And I suppose in a sense that's what I'd like to do and that's why I come here. Solitude and ecstasy. that art was something that humanity brought to uh, protect humanity itself from the arbitrariness, the wildness of nature, including human nature. That art intervenes between the best and the worst that's in us, whereby the best, he would mean, our tendency to use inner reason and introspection to seek and, and produce order in our surroundings. of art was to induce a state of wonder and serenity. Glenn was fascinated by psychoanalysis and psychiatry and frequently mentions them in his writings. Also for radio, he interviewed psychiatrists, one of whom had found a parallel between humming and a general withdrawal from the realities of the outside world. But Glenn didn't discuss that, however. Another psychiatrist was introduced as 
psychiatrist and harpsichordist. Glenn interviewed him on the subject of the psychological makeup of musicians who yield the urge to play concertos in public. A mildly provocative subject. Two elegantly named fictional psychiatrists were created by Glenn, S.F. Lemming and Wolfgang von Krankmeister. These weren't the only inventions. There was Dr. Karl Heinz Klopfweiser, one of three master critics. A second was Sir Nigel Twitt Thornwaite, the editor-in-chief of Field and Theme, the country gentleman's guide to music and the garden. A third was the widely respected American critic, Theodore Slutz. As far as I'm concerned, when you're dealing with uh, middle Mozart there, you go mainly for the beach, you know, like... Uh, you he, as we know, wanted to control his entire art environment. He wanted to control the relationships with people. Um, and he, in fact, wanted to control the critics by creating all of the, the opposing points of view uh, that might ever arise. He thought he had controlled any kind of negative situation. It would be a mistake not to recognize that these characters were quite vivid to Glenn and very much a part of him and all part of his great need for control. Sometimes by turning on these fictitious individuals, he was able to joke about and deal with awkward or worrisome situations. Glenn loved doing accents and he was very good at some of them too. However, pride of ancestry didn't help with his Scottish accent. He was reluctant to admit his attempts were not very good. And they heard McPherson say, so, all that glitters is not gold. As a humorist, Glenn had no end of trouble letting go of a joke, particularly when doing a skit in dialect. He once said that a virtue the great few writers had in common was that they always knew when to stop. As a humorist, this eluded Glenn. But in one fugal composition, he was evidently aware of the fault. A temptation Glenn couldn't resist was the telephone. His incredibly long calls at all hours became legendary. He really preferred dealing with people at a distance, often equating direct human contact with confrontation. Also, he wished to maintain control over his many business and personal relationships. So, communication at a distance, the telephone. His scope of things was not limited to music. We spent hours on the phone. When he was doing that Jubilee album, he phoned me and he was getting some sound effects and he, he opened the door and apparently he was flushing the toilet to get the sound of the water in the northern um, part of Canada and he kept saying, now is that okay? Do you know what that is? <laughs> I used to get them around 6.30. They lasted till midnight. When the phone rang and a voice at the end said, hello JR, this is Gigi here. One began something which was an exciting moment in, in one's day. He was so alive, he was so d dynamic, there was a thought if not every second, every minute, a new idea, something stimulating, something exciting. We had made an arrangement to rehearse somewhere at the CBC or somewhere. And he called and said something happened to his car and he couldn't, uh, he, he was going to pick me up. And uh, so I said, oh, well, it's too bad, you know, when shall we meet again? Oh, no, that's, you know, why don't we rehearse on the telephone? Well, I mean, that was the first sort of note that he was going to hear, as it were, from my throat. And, I mean, I can't sing on the telephone and... <laughs> So he started to sing the accompaniment, and of course I, you know, I squawked out something. No, I don't like rehearsing on the telephone. I like talking on the telephone perhaps, but no. <laughs> he would sing scores to me on the telephone till all hours until we had to have a cutoff time at 11. By the way, this um, little gadget on which I just played that fugue is, in case you're wondering, um, not exactly a piano and not exactly a harpsichord. It's a neurotic piano that thinks it's a harpsichord. And I'm going to close it now because it's also too noisy. One amusing anecdote 
on my radio program, we played a first release of some very early Schoenberg songs, and we had a contest. We asked listeners to call in or write in if they could identify the piece of music. And of course, we had only one person who called in and identified this piece of music, and that was Glenn. And our present, the giveaway record, was one of his records. <laughs> so we had to tell him we were very sorry, but we were not going to send him one of his own records, and he could have another record if he wished, and he didn't wish anything. He just wanted to be correct in his answer. As a teenager, Glenn had found good reason to admire Schoenberg's music. His teachers hated it. <laughs> your cards on the table, you, you really don't like the Schoenberg, do you? Well, Glenn, I was very anxious to uh, take you up on the invitation to play it because I admire you and know that you know more about Schoenberg and have a genuine understanding of Schoenberg, perhaps than anyone else. And I'm always interested in, in learning about something through the eyes of someone who understands it and loves it. Because I've always had the motto in my life that anyone who liked something knew more about it than one who didn't. But if you could put it into one or two basic complaints, other than the registrational ones and the fact that it doesn't quite fit the instrument, what is your, uh, your real anxiety about this piece? I mean, what basically disturbs you most of it? Well, the fact that there is a curious discrepancy between the gesture and the words. It's as if you would had taken the uh, um, words apart of, of say, a play uh, of Hamlet or Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and merely strung together an arbitrary sequence of syllables, uh, which had no meaning as such. Mm -hmm. But the the rhythm and the gesture of the play were were yes. copied absolutely, so yes. that the person who knew the play would recognise mm -hmm. the places where the love scene takes place and where yes. the, the ghost turns up and so on. It's a marvelous analogy. And uh, uh, therefore, I pr personally cannot believe that this music stands on its own. Glenn's love of working out intensely intricate problems led him to Schoenberg's music. Solving the mysteries of Schoenberg was like tackling a giant complex crossword puzzle. And I can play it thanks to you with a certain conviction. But I feel that the conviction I bring it is the convic conviction of the gesture and not of the notes. <laughs> Arnold Schoenberg, the man who changed music, was the subject of one of four major portraits Glenn composed for radio. Another was Richard Strauss. Glenn wrote passionately about Strauss, but admitted it was difficult. Difficult because he quite simply believed that Strauss was the greatest musical figure who has lived in this century. As simple as that. He stands outside of what we think of as being the progressive way, that's true. But I'm not at all sure that the example of Richard Strauss won't yet serve an extremely important historical purpose. It'll take time for this to happen. We're still too close to him. But eventually, without minimizing all of the other great figures of our time, I suspect that